develop trust through a demanding but supportive relationship. I love that language. I think when you're teaching your faculty to be mentors, I think when you're talking to your success coaches, um, to your advisors, a demanding but supportive relationship, right? You don't just get away with everything. I have high expectations of you. I have a lot of confidence you're gonna do well. So you have to do the things that you have to do. But also, do not ever be ashamed with me. Don't turn away from me. Don't feel embarrassed. I am firmly on your side. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for episode 53 of Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, joined today by Matt Boisvert. Hey, Matt. Hello. Good to see you, Rachel. Um, I'm excited today. We're going to talk about imposter syndrome, yeah. which is pretty rampant, I think, on our campuses right now <laughs> for a lot of our students. And so it's super yeah. timely for us to be discussing this. Get all of my friends joining. Hi, guys. Good to see you. It's so nice to have you back. Thanks yeah, for joining. Uh, for sure. Um, let's see. Well, I don't know, Matt, do you have any interesting things on your list before we drive dive into our content for today? Um, well, I just, I didn't, I had planned to take a trip this weekend and I didn't take a trip. So I thought I'd sit over on the French lighthouse side. Oh, I like it. These are some French lighthouses. Uh, so I feel like um, I'm in a different yeah. place. You were going to go to Colorado. Did you see this plane that was supposed to leave from New York to go to Denver and it taxied for eight and a half hours until it literally yeah. went out of gas and then they made everybody get off? And Nightmare. for the eight and a half hours, they didn't do food or beverage. They just had them sit there. And the only reason they <laughs> decided to cancel the flight was because the steward stewardesses and stewards were on overtime then. So they taxied back to the gate. And by the time they got there, they'd run out of gas to be able to make it to Denver. So that, so that would have been a nightmare. That's a total nightmare. I can't, I cannot handle that. So no, I mean, we've been flight. stuck on a plane before for a long time. Oh, a very long uh, time. But I think it was like four hours and that was about all I could take. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, then let's dive into the State of the Union. What is the State of the Union? I mean, it's pretty good. It's going okay. pretty well. I was going to say last week, you noticed I did no COVID reporting last week because I checked it and it's basically like, yeah, I mean, there's stuff going on, but nothing, no huge closures. Some people are still masking. Some people are rethinking their vaccine mandates which I know a bunch of schools did, but mostly I feel like everybody's kind of got a handle on it and they're going on with the business of higher education. So that's nice. It is very um, nice. Yeah. So I don't know if you saw on Tuesday, there was a, it's called a fireside chat, which I don't really know what that means. And I didn't actually see it. I just read an article. So I can't tell you if there was a fireside. But it was hosted by the American Council on Education. It was in D.C. And they had on as their guest the U.S. Surgeon General. And he, at this conversation, urged college administrators to hire more counselors and establish programs where students can help each other cope with mental health struggles. That's coming out of this survey by Gallup and Lumina that says mental health is one of the top reasons now for um, students considering dropping out of college. So more than 70% of college presidents have identified mental issues as a top concern for their students over the past 18 months. That figure is up from 41% in April, 2020. So March, we sent everyone home. April, they'd done like one, <laughs> one week, maybe two weeks in quarantine. Here we are two years later and that's increased 30 something percent. So I'm preaching to the choir, you guys. I know, I know that every campus we go to, it is just a like, what is going on with our students? They are ill-equipped to handle stress, anxiety, depression. They're feeling super overwhelmed. Their acclimation to community life where people are around all of the time has been really difficult. Um, 
And I'm just hearing from so many of you, like having to teach basic things to our students because they're really struggling with their mental health coming out of the pandemic. So, yeah, it's interesting. Inside Higher Ed just did a voice of the student. And that's like 2000 students who responded to the survey. And in that survey, 56% of students said they were uh, their overall mental health is either just fair or poor. And I mean, when you just look look at a res hall, you know, one out of two students, um, pretty, pretty rough right now. Yeah. Um, okay. Another thing, you know, Matt, you and I have been talking, I think for like a year and a half now about schools going to test optional. There's a lot of discussion about like, okay, what do we do? We're talking to our clients who are not on the admission side, but on the student success and support side. And they're saying <clears throat> we're having a really hard time because without those test scores to help us make decisions, we're admitting students who are needing more support than we feel like we're able to give them. So we've been talking about this a long time. So I wanted to tell you that Louisiana public colleges have just created their sort of metric for how they are going to admit uh, students into their schools without an SAT or SAT, uh, ACT or SAT. And what I like about it is that they are trying to sort of capitalize and leverage things that do show a student's academic achievement, and they've cast a really wide net on that. So depending on the college, some of the colleges are going to be more highly selective than other colleges. They yeah. have different kind of ranks of like, here's what you have to have accomplished, right, in order to get to this school. But they're looking at four things. So every college in the state system says, if you have an associate's degree, you that counts. You've yeah. shown that you can do the work. We're not concerned about you. You're good. Um, then they're looking at a certain GPA in specific high school courses, and those are core courses. So it's English, math. For some of the less selective institutions, they're looking for a GPA of 2.0 or higher in those core cl courses, but that might go all the way up for a more selective institution for like 3.0, right? They're also looking at early college credits so a number and a gpa so you have for example southeastern louisiana university who wants 12 early college credits with the least a gpa of 2.0 and then a more selective school like louisiana state campus might want you to have 18 credits with at least a 2.5 so <clears throat> i really like this because it speaks to that ftf zero the transfer credit piece that we see as a high risk on campuses, they're like, hey, if you've already done it and maintained some success for at least a full semester, we're going to give you credit for that. That totally counts, right? So high school courses or early college credits with the GPA or an associate's degree or an SAT or ACT score that they've uh, identified. So I know so many of you guys are in the middle of that conversation. I just thought it was a really nice model to take into consideration all of the ways we might be able to measure your academic success. I'd be really interested to see what uh, courses they identified. I've said several times, I love the way that Alberta does it. I don't know if it's all across Canada, but for our schools in Alberta, where they, they pick, these are the core classes, mm -hmm. very similar. And just look at that average as, as kind of your entrance average. So it's great. Yeah, I was trying to see if they said specifically, they just say core classes, but surely they're going to have to have a metric that's even across um, yeah. across all of their different campuses. So, okay, <clears throat> um, this article that comes out of Inside Higher Ed is really about, so I don't know if you guys saw the latest sort of edition of the Chronicle is about how we can grow our schools given lower birth rates, students not choosing to come to school. There's just like a lot of upheaval about where are we going to get students and how are we going to keep them? Yeah. And one of the things that they were emphasizing is creating these bridge programs, selective colleges, bridging with community colleges. And so this article talks about here's all the things that you can do in order to foster that kind of relationship. For example, they really want presidents from selective institutions to go to their counterparts at community colleges and say, tell me about your students, tell me about what they need, tell me about how we can get our faculty to co-teach courses, how can we make sure that we're our administrators and our advisors 
um, and our mentors are all using the same kind of language about what we're going to do. So I, I love that. I think that's a great idea. And you were just saying, what's the school that has been super successful with this already as they, well, their presidents are working together? So James Madison University, um, they partnered with Blue Ridge Community College. And what's really interesting about their, and they literally call it Bridge to Madison. What's really interesting about this is if you're a student at Blue Ridge, you can be a part of this bridge program and you're selected. It's You, you have to apply and go through a selection process. But not only are you, is it a, a sure transfer in to James Madison, but you actually get to live on campus at James Madison while you're a part of this program. So if you think about <clears throat> the declining population, maybe you have some openings in your res halls, this is a great kind of first way of, of making that connection with the community college and building building those bonds with with the school. So I, yeah. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, so it's interesting because they, they say also um, one of the main reasons why students at community colleges don't do this transfer to selective students or selective colleges is because of financial need. So they really advocate for having a pool of financial aid that you can give your transfer students that's specifically for them. Yeah. Um, and also to recognize that a lot of those students have supplemental needs like child care costs or housing costs. So if you can roll that into the package that you're offering by saying you can come and stay in our res halls, that's really, really attractive to them. Um, and then also just making sure that your transfer students have leadership opportunities and access to high impact experiences. So being able to say, how are we gonna engage our transfer students in our community? I think, um, I think that's gonna become more and more important and also more and more prevalent as we try to figure out where we're gonna get more students into our schools. So love that. Yep, it's great. More to say about that one? Oh, there's a lot. It's just neat if you think about what we saw with COVID and sending students home and what, what they gave up. So. One of the things that it pointed out is by living on residence halls, the, these are the other benefits like having Wi-Fi access. I mean, things that we really took for granted until um, that, you know, kind of curtain was raised and we saw all of the challenges. So it's basically leveraging all of your um, infrastructure, exactly. right, to be able yeah. to support these yeah. students. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one I have for you, um, this is from the Daily Yonder. I think it's so interesting. This article is called for some top colleges is titled for some top colleges, rural students are coming into focus. So Yale has recently hired a recruiter to go into rural towns and connect with students and say, hey, we want you to come to school here. And so they talk a lot about these students who maybe have not been head of like their student government because their school's really small or whatever but they are responsible in some cases for like a whole farm. Like you're responsible for getting up every morning at three and feeding the cows. And if you don't do it, we can't have a livelihood, right? That is a super responsible student. Or they talk about students who are running the tractors and the like mathematical equations they're doing about the turns they have to do and how much yield and blah, blah, you know, just all of this stuff. And so the point of this article is giving opportunities for students like that. First of all, inviting them, saying you are the kind of student that we wanna have, um, but also giving them opportunities to talk about things that maybe they don't know about. It reminds me of the um, project that we work with Shriner on, where you have students who are doing just like their normal work study, but they need somebody to help them articulate. Yes, you worked at the cafeteria, but you showed up on time, you did hard work, you had to negotiate conflicts, you had to write all of that kind of stuff. These rural kids are kids that maybe don't look good in terms of all of the extracurricular activities that you would fill out, but they're super responsible and have a lot of things that they can talk about. So I, I could go on a long time about this because when I was working <laughs> with students on their resume and, and I would meet a, a student who grew up on a farm and they just had duties included and they just like, I mean, you know, bailed and all, all duties included. And I said, hold on, can we just talk about <laughs> what this does that experience? mean? Because I've never done it, you know, worked with bull weevil eradication. So, okay, I've never heard of a bull weevil. Can we talk through yeah. what that means? You know, and, and so it's a really, I, I think, I love what you said, just helping students articulate, but also mm -hmm. for 
for your recruiters to go find those hardworking um, students in these rural towns. I mean, for some of our schools, that's kind of their bread and butter. So yeah. I'm a little sad that Yale's headed out that way. I know, but, but listen, I think there are plenty of students. And one of the things that they were saying is like, these students don't often get courted. So even just showing up at their their college or their career fair or whatever and and courting them and saying we have a place for you we love students like like you they were also talking about how hard it is to find rural students because you have a lot of rural students that maybe um if you just look at the kind of classification of them like where their school is it's suburban but that's because they're driving an hour every day to get to school they live way out in the yeah. country somewhere and so it's a hardship to figure out how do you connect with those rural students and appreciate i mean if you're driving an hour to get to school every day already you are more responsible than most people in the world you know for sure <laughs> So Absolutely. anyway, I love that idea. I think it's definitely something to explore. Um, and I think they would be grateful to be courted, you know, by schools who say, I, hey, I, was, trying to look, I was trying to look this up uh, because there's a there's a tiny school district in the Panhandle of Texas where they have a robotics team that goes to state all the time, like wow. phenomenal. But no one would really know it unless you were going to like the robotics yeah. tournament, you know. So yeah. So that's exactly what this recruiter from Yale was saying is it's the hardest part is to find these students. Because once you do, they're bright and they want to go someplace and they know yeah. that it will bring a lot of like respect to their family and like everyone will be joyful, but you've got to figure out where they are. So that kind of thing would be a great way to pursue them. So Okay, I have one more uh, State of the Union, and that actually is a fair State of the Union. This is very exciting. So we are about to roll out our texting feature. That's a new feature um, for our site. There is a cost related to that, but that's just because it costs us to give you numbers and to store all of your texts, but it's going to be integrated into the log. I am thrilled. I have been wanting this for our schools for so long. Um, and so if you think about just the way that you do your regular email, now you can do two-way texting where you can text a student and they can text you back and you can text them back and vice versa. Like, awesome. Also, you can do campaigns. So when it's advising time, you can be like, hey, guys, don't forget that you. Yeah, I know, Lisa, isn't that so exciting? <laughs> okay, so you guys just have to and be chat watching. Virtual, so that's good news. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you just have to be watching for news about that. But I am super, super excited. I think when we talk about how we connect to students, that texting piece is just instrumental in the way we do that. So that is um, very, we're very happy it's about super that. I kind of feel like George Lucas, you know, he he says that he was waiting for the technology to catch up to be able to capture his full vision for for the original three episodes. Yeah. I don't know if you, and I feel like finally the technology has caught up for for it to be delivered the way that we wanted to yeah. and seamlessly tied into our log. And so it's, yeah. so it's great. It's going to be great. For sure. And that is the state of the union. Okay. Hey, so hey, let's, let's move on. I want to talk about something that is super important, especially right now, Matt, I don't, I don't know how to describe how I'm feeling about plunging into all of this freshman stuff while it's happening. You and I have not had this experience because we started this podcast two years ago. And so mostly what we've been talking about is how crazy it is, take care of yourself, how we're adjusting, like, right. So we haven't actually had the experience of talking about just general, everyday, run-of-the-mill freshman retention <laughs> at all. And we sure haven't had the experience of being able to talk about it right now when it's something you can do something about on your campus. You have all of your students on campus. They're getting used to it. They're deciding whether or not they belong here. Like right now. Right now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought so you were going to say, I thought you were going to say right now, while you're, my son Aiden is that freshman going to college. So when we talk about these things, it's personal. You know, yeah, 
I mean, it for sure, that for sure helps, but I'm just thinking as a practitioner, the like sort of frantic, like chomping at the bit to find the right students and do the right thing right now, because this right now, what we're doing is going to come out in the measurements for persistence and then retention. And so yeah. it's just a, it's just a spot of action that I feel really heavily. And so I want to talk about imposter syndrome. I don't think this is a new concept for anybody. Imposter syndrome just means because you're not certain that you belong. So when we think about this, it's the antithesis of sense of belonging. So you have people who are like, I belong here. I fit. I know what I'm doing. I'm doing a great job. And then you have imposter syndrome, which is like, I'm walking around among people. I have no right to be here. When they find out the truth about me, they're going to kick me out. They've probably made a terrible mistake. My days are numbered. I'm a total imposter and I'm not going to be successful at this work, right? And so it's really important for freshmen because so many freshmen have it. I think you, uh, so many college students have it. So many people have it <laughs> in their yeah. lives, right? Where you're just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, I, I'm trying, you know, Um but students who are struggling from this imposter syndrome, a couple of things. First of all, they are convinced they are going to fail before they even begin. So we talk about how important it is to get ahead of that curve because they, because they, they are coming in with success debt, not based on any truth other than they are convinced that they do not belong here and they're not going to be successful. So that's the first thing it does. The other thing is imposter syndrome has a high correlation with things like anxiety, depression, and psychological distress. As you can imagine, if you were walking around like thinking the whole time, I hope nobody finds out that I'm not supposed to be here, that I'm not really one of these people, that I'm don't that I'm not smart enough or I'm not whatever, you would be super anxious and depressed and overwhelmed all the time. So a high correlation of this mental health that we're talking about. And then also students with imposter syndrome are less likely to A, ask for help because they're trying to protect the secret that they don't belong here. So they have to pretend like they know what's going on. They're not, they don't have any questions because they're, of course they belong here. So they must understand everything, right? Super protective. Um, and also less successful to build relationships with their colleagues, their peers, their faculty, and their staff because they are so they feel so vulnerable that it's like anybody who gets close to me is gonna know. They're gonna find out my secret, and then I, when I fail, they're gonna be like, "Yeah, of course you're gonna fail because we don't even know how you got here, right?" So just thinking about, you know, I have such a tender heart towards our students, our freshman students who have difficulty fitting in. And just thinking about walking around on a campus with this overwhelming fear that I do not belong here. And if anybody gets close to me or I ask any questions, they're going to be like, we're really sorry to inform you. We did not mean to admit you. It's clear you can't be successful here and you have to go, right? We so Rachel, you've talked, about, you've talked about success debt in, in a lot of ways, but to think that you're starting off with that weight already yeah. feeling like I'm already behind. As soon yeah. as I start, I'm behind. Look at all these people who are, you know, shiny and they know what's going on. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So what's interesting about this imposter syndrome is it can come from a lot of different places. Um, I was reading in, so this is, this conversation is heavily influenced by this relationship, rich education, highly recommend. Um, I was reading about this student who applied to a college she really wanted to go to and she got waitlisted. And she was, she was saying like, my family was so supportive. They were just like, Hey, be tenacious. Like you keep going, you keep talking to the admissions people. She's like, I honestly feel like they let me in because they were tired. They were like, this girl is not going to go away. So we're going to let her in. But she said she was so excited, but then every class she went into, she walked in with a feeling of, but I was a waitlisted student. I'm a second yeah. choice student. All of these students got chosen first. I don't really, really belong here. And so that feeling, she feels like an imposter, 
I don't belong here and I don't know what I'm doing, right? Um, but there's a lot of ways that we could see this with our students. First generation, we think about that all the time. This is a group of students who can feel like an imposter. Like, I don't know what you guys are talking about and maybe this is not for me, right? Um, we think about this with academic preparedness. So maybe I got a 3.8 at my high school, but I also know that it was not a rigorous high school and they were not doing a great job preparing me. And so I'm coming in knowing I don't really belong here. Do you wanna say more about that one? Well, I'm thinking about the students. So on the flip side, you know, as we've talked about students who are FTF zero, the zero transfer credit hours, versus those who come in with at least three hours of transfer yeah. credit. At some of our schools, it's just one credit hour, if, and that makes a difference for retention. But if you earn uh, AP or dual credit, maybe that's part of it as well. It's like, well, I it's going to be hard, but I've been successful before, versus those who are FTF zeros, they've never yeah. earned college credit in any way. Yeah, maybe that's sure. part of that. Yeah, so it's interesting because we also have this demographic characteristic piece, which is like I am a female in a STEM um, STEM program, so I am an imposter. I don't really belong here. We have this when you have a like African American student on a campus where they're not graduating African American students, and so they look around and they're like, I don't understand. I don't belong here right? You've let me come in, but I feel like an imposter. Um, and a lot of this comes out of the kind of research about how easy it is to put a student in a stereotype threat. So we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. But you just think about anything where you say, I do not belong here, you're more likely to experience um, this imposter syndrome. I was laughing about this, Matt, because I feel like, <laughs> maybe this is too much information about me, but I feel like mostly being an adult, I have imposter syndrome. I feel like a lot of people feel this way where it's like, Rachel, you're an adult. I'm like, I don't know, am I? Like, I mean, I'm trying, I'm trying stuff. I guess it's working out okay. Like, you know, I'm not making huge mistakes, but I think a lot of times that it's like, when our college students are about to graduate and they sort of have a panic attack about being an adult and you're like, hey, just so you know, nobody knows what they're doing. We all just like go try to do stuff and we're successful because, you know, we're trying hard. But I think that that's a really big piece for our students understanding that they mostly just feel like they're faking it, right? Um, okay, let me see if I want to say anything else about that. One more thing I wanted to tell you is, do you remember the study where they, in elementary school, randomly picked a bunch of kids and told their elementary school teacher, these five students, we've given them a test and they are off the charts smart. They're going to be super successful this year. We expect to see great growth in them. And there was nothing special about these kids, but because they told the teachers the outcome of that was that those students did see great growth. They did do better than their peers just because their students or their teachers were like, hey, you do belong here. You are doing a great job. I expect great things from you, right? Yeah, belonging is such a huge part to overcoming. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, I think it's helpful to know as you're talking about being an adult that, that uh, this is according to the Cleveland Clinic that seven out of 10 adults uh, say that they have experienced imposter syndrome at one point or another. So that's yeah. helpful. Yeah, I don't know. Like yeah. you gotta pay your taxes and change your oil. How do we do that? I don't know. You just gotta go do it, yeah. just figure it yeah. out. Um, okay, another piece of imposter syndrome is that you have this shame. So it's it comes from hiding a deep doubt about your own capacity to be successful academically. So I wanna read this to you. Um, this comes out of this, the, this survey with all of these students, they did a lot of conversations and they said, um, here's the kind of overriding theme that came out of all of these students who are experiencing imposter syndrome. Students fear failure and being challenged beyond their limits. They may not have been challenged academically in high school and for the first time are really experiencing academic rigor. They fear embarrassing their families, 
being afraid to come home and say, I'm not achieving in college right now. I'm struggling. They fear talking to a professor because a professor represents an intimidating authority figure. They are not sure how to approach them. They also resist asking for help or asking for a tutor because utilizing a tutor is perceived as not being smart. They don't want to go to counseling when they have emotional problems because that's for people who are weak. weak. The fear of shame is everywhere. Which... I appreciate his narrative on that because I think we know like, yeah, fear of shame is everywhere. But when you really start to internalize what that is like, um, and you guys, I don't think we can provide good, holistic, academic, social, social, emotional support without understanding that our students are walking around mostly terrified that they're going to do a bad job right right Uh, that narrative that they're giving themselves of i don't know what i'm doing i don't belong here and um matt you and i have talked before about the scariest thing about shame is that when you feel shame you turn away from people instead of turning towards them right? So that's what shame does. It makes you turn your back and be protective. And you don't want people to know you and you don't want them to know what's going on inside of you because you're ashamed of it. You're embarrassed. You don't want them to see. And so I think recognizing that shame piece, but also understanding when I'm saying the connection with students. So thinking about when a student's not doing a good job and you send an email to them and there is the hint of shame message in there. You have just made your job a hundred times harder because they turn away from that. They're not running to your office to see if you can help them. They're gonna be like, there's another person I have to avoid because if they get too close, they for sure are gonna know how much I don't belong here, right? And so understanding the students who are the hardest to connect with that avoid us and read our emails, but don't do what we ask them to and don't come to our office, that is, that is a reflection of them feeling shame and wanting to be isolated and turn away from anybody who can help them. And if you don't address that piece, it's going to be very hard for you to get to them. So do you have anything you want to add about that? Well, I just, I mean, you're always talking about normal normalizing. So instead of shaming them, the, the opportunity that you have to come alongside them and, and be a little, Um, You talked about this in culture code, right? I'm going to reveal some things to you about how I struggled or how I felt like an imposter. And guess what? You're not alone. Here's here's a lot of things, you know. So exactly what you're saying, just being able to come alongside them and share with them your story, how how that affected you and why it's holding that student back. But you're there to help them would be very helpful. I used to say to my students all the time when they were like, oh my gosh, my GPA, you know, it's so embarrassing, blah, blah. And I'd be like, you, I have an advantage. You have no idea what my GPA was in college, right? And they're like, what? And I'm like, and look, I'm doing okay. It's going to be okay. We just got to figure out how to recover on this. But saying to them like, hey, this is not, it, it is unconditional positive regard. There's not a thing you're going to tell me where I'm going to be like, oh, okay, you can go because this is a wreck, right? Um, I want us to think about this idea of stereotype threat, which oftentimes is connected to imposter syndrome. So this, these are things that you have to deal with in a situation because you have been given a specific social identity. And so oftentimes when a student experiences stereotype threat, it's a very subtle message that you're right, you don't belong here. And it doubles down on their imposter syndrome. So let me give you some examples of this. So you've been given a very um, specific social identity. So you are old, or you are a Latino, or you are a conservative, or you are a Yankee at this West Texas school, right? Um, So the fact that I know everybody is thinking something about me because I'm old and I'm going to school makes it more difficult for me to accept belonging cues and makes it more likely that I'm going to have the antithesis of belonging, which is feeling like I'm an imposter, right? Mm -hmm. You and I have this experience um, (laughs) when we go to conferences and somebody refers to us as a vendor 
And we're always like, wait, who's the vendor? Oh, oh, you're saying we're a vendor. We've been given this social identity, which doesn't resonate with you or me. In fact, I'm more likely to feel like I'm an imposter with vendors than I am in higher education circles, right? But somebody saying like, oh, you're a vendor. And we understand that that's a whole set of stuff that has just been put on us. Like, we're not experts. We're not trying to help you solve your problems. We're not committed to student success. We want your money. We want to sell you this thing. Like I, all the stuff about being a vendor versus when we come to a campus to see our friend, Lisa, and she's like, Hey, Rachel, what do you think we should do about this thing? The social identity she's given me then is an expert who's done this work and she wants help with a problem she's having. That's a totally different experience for me than her saying, hey, vendor, like, <laughs> why are you coming to campus or just to schmooze us, right? Yeah. That's a good example of that stereotype threat because we've, we've been put in our pigeonhole and it doesn't matter if it's true about us. We understand everybody thinks this about it and then it changes the way that we perform, really. Do you have more you want to say about that? Don't call us a vendor. <laughs> If you want to make me very sad, call me a, a vendor. Um, yeah. Okay, so a couple of things about this stereotype threat. I cannot overstate for you how significant this is. So there's some great um, research by Claude Steele. I would recommend you read his research. He has a lot to say about the effects of stereotype um, threat. Um, he talks about it in terms of gender. He talks about it in terms of ethnicity. I just want to give you two examples. So Matt, you're going to have to help me with this one because I feel like I butcher it every time. But basically, they did a study where they had two groups, both uh, mixed gender, male and female, and they were going to give them a math test. And they said to the first group, hey, guys, there's no difference if you're a man or a woman when you take this test. Everybody does the same. And yep. then the second group, they literally said nothing about gender. They didn't talk about it, nothing. They give the test on the group where they said to the, the people, hey, men or women, doesn't matter. You both do the same on this test. Mention there, gender. Adam. The ones was, that mentioned gender. There was no gap between the women's performance and the men's performance. Okay. So they set the stage of like, that has nothing to do with this. On the one where they didn't say anything about gender, there was a gender gap, women performed worse than men. And so the theory is that the sort of prevailing wins are that women are not as good as ma at math. So without a correction to that, like they did in the first group, women come in with this stereotype threat. I'm a woman, therefore I won't do as well on this test as my male counterpart. So interesting. Yeah, it's um, like they applied their own bias to it. Right. Right. And so thinking for our students, how do we do a good job of, of making sure that we either are correcting that uh, stereotype or we are not putting students in a position to remind them about this stereotype threat? So the, the, to that um, point, they also did um, an experiment where they had... Uh, African-American students and white students who were taking a test. They had all of the students indicate their race right before they took the test. So just write down on the top of your test, if you're African-American or white or Hispanic or Native American or whatever, write it down. When they did that, students performed to stereotypes. So the white students did better. All of the non-white students did not do as well as the white students simply by reminding them at the beginning of the test, remember people have some opinions based on your race. That's to how me, minor that is. To me, that that's where that word, when you say stereotype threat, to, to yes. me, that really embodies it. We have to be really thoughtful about the words that we choose or, or the, what's the reason for asking this question or how do yes. we call out a student or is that, is there good intent there? Um, yeah. Or, you know, we know that that will help or are you being, you know, you're not being thoughtful and it actually can hurt. Yeah. So it's interesting because this is always my counsel. I get very, very nervous when we talk about our predictive model. We talk about our impact cohort. 
Um, even I get very nervous when we talk about feedback requests from faculty members. So I have a referral on a student who's not doing well in math and I'm asking faculty like, hey, how are they doing in your class? I'm very, I get very nervous about those things. Who needs to know why they're at risk? How do we subtly send messages, for example, in a feedback request that say like, John Smith's not doing so great. What do you think about him, right? Even those subtle things for a teacher to know, well, that's weird. They're doing great in my class, but they're not doing well in these other classes. Maybe they're not doing so well. Not great. Right. right. So who needs to see your impact cohort? Who needs to see the predictive model? We've got to be very, very careful with how we use that information. And if you're doing something like an impact cohort, you have to do good training on the front end to say to faculty, hey, you don't need to tell this student, oh, you're in the impact cohort. That's why blah, 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 right? That's why Debbie's work on that conditionally admitted student to change it from conditionally admitted to something else, which is resource-based and student-centric, makes all the difference in the world. Because if I come in and you're like, eh, we'll see. I don't think you're going to make it, but we'll see about it, right? Wait, wait, Already, let's... I'm stuck. Got Already, it. I'm like, well, clearly I don't belong here. And I have a stereotype threat, which is... I'm a conditionally admitted student. I must not be, be able to be successful here. So um, what I really think is helpful about this stereotype threat is, sorry, did you have more you wanted to say about that? No. no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, what I think is really interesting is that Claude Steele's research says there are specific ways that you can fight against a stereotype threat. So first of all, Develop trust through a demanding but supportive relationship. I love that language. I think when you're teaching your faculty to be mentors, I think when you're talking to your success coaches, um, to your advisors, a demanding but supportive relationship, right? You don't just get away with everything. I have high expectations of you. I have a lot of confidence you're going to do well. So you have to do the things that you have to do. But also, do not ever be ashamed with me. Don't turn away from me. Don't feel embarrassed. I am firmly on your side, right? And I, if we think about our belonging cues, this comes back to, I'm expending energy with you. I am present with you, and I'm going to be helpful to you, right? Also, he says, you have to develop hopeful narratives about belonging in the system or in this setting. So saying, hey, we have a future together hey, I'm going to be your advisor for the next four years. I'm going to be your residence assistant until you move into your sophomore dorm. How do we create this narrative that gives us a vision of the future? And remember, that's another belonging cue. How do we talk about this relationship as extending into the future beyond what's happening right now? Talk about, I love this one, Matt, uh, arrange informal cross-group conversations, arrange those conversations to reveal that identity is not the sole cause of negative experiences in this setting. Okay, so here's what that's saying. Basically, you get a bunch of people. Some of them are experiencing imposter syndrome. Some of them are having stereotype threats. And somebody says, hey, I'm having a really hard time in my astronomy class. I can't understand anything that's happening in there. I'm really afraid that the reason I'm not doing well in that class is because of the social identity I've been given. I don't think I belong here. And everybody in the whole group would be like, we don't know what he's talking about either. <laughs> it's that not is me. not yeah. about you not belonging here. That is about, we. he's not a great teacher. He's too smart for us. I don't know, right? But if you just think about all the ways that you could build that in on your campus, like my advisor is not responding to my calls. I can't get her on the phone. She's not being helpful to me, blah, 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 That's blah, blah. Like she hasn't yeah. met with me. Okay. She must not like me because I'm a woman in a STEM system. And then everyone's like, oh, no, she doesn't. She's a terrible advisor. She's actually not helpful at all. That's not about you. Those are extreme experiences and examples, right? But it's super helpful in your first year experience class to be saying, hey, guys, um, perhaps your difficulty is not so much about your identity. It's actually a broken part of the system that everybody is experiencing that you actually fit in with us. Great. Right. Right. Um, I love this one because as you reminded me today, it's related to Carol Dweck's work with, um, what's it called now? I can't remember it. Uh, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. 
So he says, Steele says, you have to represent critical abilities as learnable. Everything that you need, every ability you need to be successful here, you can learn. You can learn how to take tests. You can learn how to make friends. You can learn how to pick your major. Everything that you need to be successful here, you will be able to learn while you're here. So I love that so much because the threat of, I don't belong here because I'm not smart enough versus you do belong here and we're going to take you on this journey that then is going to help you be successful, I think is such an important conversation. Um, okay, so anything that you want to add to this idea of stereotype threat or um, imposter syndrome? I just think it's so well. I mean, <laughs> I am ready to get to the action items this whole time I've been holding off saying action <laughs> items. So, but yeah, so... Looking at both of those at the same time, I, I think that's so important, Rachel, and I haven't. Um, I, we've kind of talked about them individually, but but to think about as you started off, right now is the time. And our RAs are seeing it as students are right now preparing for their first either assignment or they have an exam coming up. So our RAs are seeing some of this and they should be experts on this, being able to read this behavior yeah. especially with students who are starting to turn away and stay locked in their room, maybe not even coming down the hall to say hi. Um, I'm looking at you, Rachel. You oh, know, sorry. like as me, yeah. <laughs> but, but really that that RAs have a, a great opportunity here. There's um we've talked about admissions counselors should be walking around right now, still right now, but but there's people all around your campus who can be experts in, in reading student behavior because it happens every year. And if anything, it's, it's um, you know, it's not a bad thing. And one thing you kind of talked about, but imposter, imposter syndrome is not a bad thing. Right. It actually means you're a high achiever. So the, the slacker doesn't ever think they're an imposter. The person who thinks they're an imposter is someone who's, who's, you know, they're wired for doing hard work, they're hardworking, they achieve things, and they're in a new challenge, and they're just, because of their brain, they're trying to see, is this, have I made a mistake? Is this yeah. going to be the time where, you know, am I setting myself up for a failure? And so I, I just think that's so important that you're learning the, the what this looks like on your students so that you can have those conversations about actually... So I don't know. I, I was thinking, Rachel, for me, um, I was thinking about grad school and I and I sat down next to the to the smartest guy I knew. And this is in statistics, and I was not doing great. And I said, look, I'm not dumb. I'm just not getting it. I don't know. And and I mean, think about that. Like I love statistics now, but but at the time I was trying, like, help me. I don't, I don't know. Is can I overcome this feeling? And he's like, no, it's hard. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, it's just hard. Yeah, yeah, so I was trying to orchestrate, I'm thinking specifically in first year experience courses, but you guys, I think you can have these individual meetings with students. I think when you run into a group of students, here are some great conversations to have. I think helping your RAs have these conversations. One thing I was thinking about um, in first year experience, especially I was thinking specifically about when we're starting to try to teach freshmen how to register, which you remember, did you ever teach first year experience class? No. Like even in a class? Oh my gosh. Teaching them how to register is like very hard because it's super stressful. You have the technology stress of like, you've got to log in at this time because if you miss the class, your whole schedule is ruined. The, what teachers stick, whatever. It's very, very stressful. Okay. okay. Um, but there's a lot, and there's a lot of technical things that they have to do. Take the right classes, get, use the technology to work, all of that stuff. And I was yeah. thinking just to say in that class, okay, I need um, you guys to ask me five silly questions, like five stupid questions that of course, everybody the dumbest, can answer you to. The dumbest questions you can ask me about advising. Because remember, imposter syndrome, they're not asking for help because they don't want anyone to know that they don't know. So I think if you cast it that way and someone's like, yeah, um, one real dumb question would be, where do we get our advising codes that I've just told you 15 times in this class period, right? 
But I promise you, somebody will be like, oh, that's where we get it because somebody asked that question. So just making it, we're going to ask all the dumbest things we can think because we're all really confused and not wanting to ask those as genuine questions, I think is a great exercise. Um, the other exercise I think that would be super helpful to do with students as an action item is for everybody to make a list of the reasons they don't belong on campus. Here's why that's helpful. Because if I write down as 18 year old Rachel, I don't belong on campus because I'm not from Texas. I don't know how to do Southern sweet. I am having trouble making friends. I don't understand these things. Like if I wrote down all of those things, two things happen. First of all, you are going to get a very clear idea of where the campus is sending um, non-belonging messages, right? So once you see that all of my stuff is, I'm not yeah. from Texas and so no one wants to talk to me, this campus has a problem. It has a problem with students who are coming from outside of a certain area feeling like I don't, this is ridiculous, I don't belong here, right? You have to fix that. You've got to address belonging cues in that way. If a student says, I don't belong here because I'm not smart enough, okay, then we have a problem. We've got to fix our messaging about, um, I told you about in this book where this faculty member was like, how many of you are pre-med? Half the class raises their hand. And he's like, okay, we're going to get that number down, right? You have a problem with your messaging when a student's like, I'm afraid I don't belong here because I'm not smart enough. Okay, we got to fix that. But also you uncover in a group of students, um, people saying like, oh my gosh, Rachel, of course you belong here. I'm so sorry you haven't felt welcome. Do you want to come to my room and hang out? Oh my gosh, of course you belong here. You're really smart. Look at everything that you did through high school. It's just a hard transition. So when you uncover those things and you can address them and help people to understand, everybody can make a list of the reasons they don't belong here, oh, the yeah. things that they feel vulnerable and anxious and ashamed about, then you open that up to really great conversation to be able to address them. Rachel, you just unlocked a, a thing for me, and I hopefully I can deliver this the right way, but um, tying back into State of the Union and, and the school that set up an alternative acceptance uh, measures. We have a school that um, they are, so they're open. Um, you can submit uh, an ACT, SAT score, but you don't have to. Um, I think there's essays that you can write to, to be admitted. So it doesn't matter if you submit your ACT score or not, uh, you can be admitted. And, I, and we just did a, a Spark report and students who submitted their ACT, if the ACT was 16 or above, they re retained at the highest rate compared to students who didn't submit an ACT score. And it was like a 30% difference. Mm. And, it, and, and so I'm thinking about this, like, well, it's kind of interesting how, how I mean, it's a 16. Right. right, it's, it's not like, like indicative of strong academic performance necessarily. But I right? wonder if that if that did something to suppress this imposter syndrome of students feeling like I don't belong. They know what it, their score sixteen means, and they were accepted versus the students who didn't submit it. So I don't know if if yeah, that's interesting. It's really interesting what kind of conversations you can then have for those students who, if you if you accept uh, students without ACT. Are there the other conversation, conversations you can have where they feel like they do academically belong? Well, don't you think that if you just said to them, hey, you have proven you can be a successful college student by completing 13 hours at a 2.5 GPA, come on in, right? Like if you yeah. have the language for each of those metrics to say, wow, it looks like you did really well in your high school cl core classes, you're prepared to be able to come in, would be helpful instead of, I think what happens is sometimes students, people feel like they got away with something. Like So know, I'm just going back to the, yeah, I'm going back to the yeah. why, why don't you belong here? Well, I didn't, I didn't do the SAT or ACT. I just wrote an essay, like, I don't even know if they read it, but they let me in, right? Versus yeah. I took the test and I, I got in. Yeah, for sure. Okay, you have two action items for us. Well, I think this is great. So I I really um, love Seth Godin. He's a marketer. He, he writes books. It's not just business marketing stuff. But um, just the other day, August 19th, on his blog, which is Seth's 
with an S dot blog. Um, he, he wrote this. This is the headline. Clues that you might not be trying hard enough. So, Matt, we were saying this is a perfect thing to discuss with students. I would just pull this out and I'd be like, I want to read this to you. Let's talk about it. Okay. So clues that you might not be trying hard enough or clues that you might be coasting or taking it easy or not seeking challenges. This is what he writes. You usually succeed. So you're not trying hard enough if if you're Mostly, usually succeeding. You only try things you know you can succeed at, right? Yeah. You rarely feel like an imposter. You already know what you need to know. And you're confident it's going to work. <laughs> Which and I, I told love you. that. I and love I told that you. because I think if you said like, hey guys, do you see that you are choosing a hard thing? It is hard. You don't know it's going to work. You don't know everything you need to know. You're not super confident. You're not sure you belong here. That means you're doing a hard, good thing, right? Yeah. And I said to you, the time that I felt the most like an imposter was playing softball. Yeah. It's not my stick. You just it's looked around and was like, I don't really think this is. I should not. Yeah. Should not be. Okay. okay. And the other thing is to say this to your students stop, stop comparing. Remember that smart, high achieving people most often deal with true imposter syndrome. So the very fact that you recognize it in yourself says a lot about you. True imposters, true imposters don't get this feeling. Uh, so that should be motivation to keep pushing forward. If you feel this way, you're doing a good job. Most, most people who are smart and high achieving deal with this. I think that speaks to that piece of demanding, but supportive relationship, right? So it's like when you are being challenged and then supported and then challenged and then supported, that is where you have that feeling of like, oh my gosh, this challenge, I don't know if I can face it. Oh, I did a good job versus somebody who's like, I don't have that ever because I don't try hard things. I don't engage in challenges. So it's not a really difficult piece for me, right? So, so that's I love from having those conversations. Oh, I was Go just going to push that up and say that's from Dr. Susan Albers, uh, a psychologist. Yeah. Um, so I think all of those conversations are great conversations to have with your peer leaders, to have with um, your students on campus, and maybe the language of imposter syndrome um, and stereotype threat are going to help us understand why we have to choose our language carefully, why we have to mitigate influences that students are already coming to campus with, right? To say this test, it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy, you're going to do the same on this test. Um, just being very, very thoughtful about this form, this formation of self that's happening for our students. It's really funny. This book that I'm reading is very much about um, academics and they're like, I really wish that we would talk about student development, like not like capital S, capital D, but like we should be thinking about our students as students that need to be developed. And I'm like, right, yes, right. that's the whole thing. We should be doing that. So <clears throat> this idea that you have students on your campus that need to be led through, you do belong here. You're not an imposter. You can be successful, I think is uh, a really powerful idea, especially for you guys right now. So especially right now, now's the time. And, and also, just remind the students, we admitted you. We wouldn't admit you if we thought you were going to fail. Yeah, for sure. All right, friends. Good to see you guys. We will be back with you next week. In the meantime, you're doing great work. Um, please join us again.